Good afternoon and a huge welcome from all of us at Jones Chase to the next Your Employment webinar in the series, providing you with essential employment law and HR updates. For those of you that are new to our webinars, we are of course Jones Chase, a firm of specialist employment lawyers, and we act for a number of companies from PLCs all the way through to startups and also some fantastic individuals as well. We have a very high success rate uh, for looking after those that we represent, which is north of 95% and very proud to say. And we've also been away for a month due to the summer break, and it does seem like longer than that. So thank you for coming back and continuing to support us for this project. We are delighted to have you with us. I should also add that today, the 16th of September 2021, is the firm's seventh birthday. So once again, thank you for joining us on this special occasion. Um, in terms of the content for the webinar, I should emphasize that the points that we're covering today are not formal legal advice, as so much depends on the fact of the case. And sometimes the approach that you may take in one case is not the same approach that you will take in another. So um, please do not rely upon what we say is constituting formal legal advice. If you have any specific um, issue that you'd like to discuss with us or any set of circumstances, definitely drop us a line. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can call me um, on the um, firm's phone number, 0203-837-9914, or drop me a line at dean.jones at joneschase.com. Um, another quick reminder that the information that we're covering today is accurate as of 4 o'clock on the 16th of September. Things are changing very quickly, so do drop us on if you have any further questions. And also, we do appreciate that everyone's time is precious, so we will finish at five o'clock today, if not before. Um, lastly, we do like helping people. So if you are aware of any other companies or individuals that uh, would work well with us or would benefit from our advice, or even um, just appreciate attending these free webinars or to get our free bulletins on employment law, um, definitely connect them with us. We, uh, we'd love to hear from you or them. And um, yeah, and just once again, thank you for your support. So um, we did have a problem with the recording of the webinar earlier today. So we did miss a little bit out um, of showing the section. So um, I've re-recorded the section, um, my apologies for that. But um, the first section that we're gonna to cover today is um, carried out by Shona, one of the firm's partners. And she's going to be speaking to you about navigating enforceable clauses in employment contracts, policies, and handbooks. So uh, once again, we'll go straight into showing the section. Thank you. Mr Langton um, started employment with his employer in 2003 and when you start employment you get a package of documents that either by email or, or post and in this, this package Mr Langton got a contract, a summary of benefits and uh, actually his offer letter which attached uh, the contract in the summary of benefits to it and the summary of benefits outlined all the great things that uh, he would have as an employee with his employer. And one of the benefits was PHI cover. And that PHI cover included, um, uh, if you're sick and you've been off for 13 weeks or more and you qualify for PHI because the PHI company will um, check you out and make sure that you are genuinely sick. The company through this insurance with the PHI cover will pay 75% of your salary uh, insured through the PHI cover. Um, and also there was a promise of a 5% accelerator. And a 5% accelerator is just an annual pay review equivalent of 5% each year. Um, naturally, Mr. Langton didn't think he was going to call on his PHI, but it is a, a very attractive benefit for employees to have. Um, as I said, this PHI cover was uh, insured by the company. So the company promised these benefits and it was back to back with what the insurers promised the company. And during the course of Mr. Langton's employment, two things happened. One is he became sick. And the other is that his employer changed. So the company was sold from a Kramer Limited to an Amdox Limited. So Amdox became the ultimate uh, owner of this organization and the ultimate uh, uh, entity with the liability that then uh, is created because of Mr. Langton's sickness. So Mr. Langton, as I said, started in 2003. Uh, he then becomes sick in 2009. He qualifies for PHI cover and he gets paid 75% of his salary. But what he hasn't been told is that in the course of the period between 2003 when he started and 2009 when he, he becomes sick, is that the uh, insurance company said to the company, uh, the employer, I'm sorry, we're no longer providing this 5% accelerator it's just 75% of the salary at the date that the employee uh, becomes sick or was last paid that accelerator. 
So this affected Mr Langton's overall income each year because he didn't get his 5% increase each year as promised. So Mr Langton brought a claim and his claim was, um, I am due that 5%, even though the company is not being paid that by the insurers, the company has promised this to me in my summary of benefits that I got in 2003 when I started and they didn't tell me it had been changed. And he succeeded in that claim and he was paid the difference between his salary as it uh, was being paid to him and with this 5% accelerator applied. And in the case of Mr. Langton, it was around about 29,000 pounds of damages. He was still getting his 75%. They got this additional 29,000. So the whole purpose of that case prompted me to think, um, as employers, when you first recruit people, uh, when there's a two-pay transfer, when there's a sale of a business, when there's a promotion, uh, possibly when there's just a, a change because your service providers, your insurance companies, your life insurance, et cetera, they change. Uh, what are you telling the employees in order to avoid a contractual obligation, which is the one that Amdocs faced, bearing in mind they thought they were covered because they had their insurance policy, but it didn't cover all the benefits as described to Mr. Langton at the outset. So the recommendation would be that when you are sending out these documents, what you um, must ensure is that what you're promising, if it changes, you vary the contract to let the employee know that that has changed. So in your contract of employment, having a variation clause or having a clause that says this is the entire agreement between us will help you in any argument when an employee comes back to say, actually, uh, when I started, I got X, and now that I need X, you're not giving that to me, I therefore have a claim. You can show where the variation has taken place and how that's been communicated to the employee and whether the employee has accepted that or not, or whether when you've issued all the original documents, such as your contract, your summary of benefits, your, your handbook, um, you're clear as to what has contractual effect and what doesn't. And often we've seen examples where you're issuing contracts where you say the terms of the offer letter and this contract from the basis of your employment. And often the offer letter will include the, the nice things that you want to tell the employee, the benefits they're getting, the holiday they're getting, the salary they're getting, the bonus they're getting. And that could be the employee's uh, inroad to suggest that that offer letter therefore has contractual effect. And if you change any of that, that uh, is a claim then that the employee can uh, make because of any loss of earnings or loss of benefit as a result. It also means that when you've got a benefits uh, group within your organization, that they keep you informed of any change to the benefits which we're uh, promising to employees because it's that change of benefit, we have to pass on the information to the employee to say this is a back-to-back -back arrangement. If the insurance company are not providing this to us, the employer, then we don't want to provide this on to you, the employee. We can only pay you what we are being paid by the insurers. So the um, case that uh, Amdocs finds itself in was an inherited insurance liability. And so when you're doing or getting involved in due diligence for buying companies or there's a 2P transfer, make sure that the benefits you're being told uh, are the genuine benefits that are being passed on to the employee and what the employees believe those benefits are and the value of them. So again, you're not caught with any shortfall. Um, and that's uh, ensuring as well that your policies are clearly referred to. There may be a contractual element in the policy. There may be a non-contractual element. Please make sure whatever you want to be held accountable for is stated as contractual, and whatever is just a guideline or a policy is stated as non-contractual. Otherwise, again, an employee can assert, well, that's my, my contractual right. And the uh, court in the Amdocs case, they used this uh, phrase, which was a, it had the language of contractual expectation. That's what the employee expected. And that language that was used in this offer letter telling them how wonderful all the benefits were, 
created that expectation, which created that contractual obligation. So um, it's just reminding you with your policies, your offer letters, this summary of benefits that some people will send out, even the benefits booklet that gets sent out uh, via the insurance company or otherwise, just make sure that you're clear when those vary, that you vary them as the employer. Um, the only other one point I wanted to add is if you are varying the working time regulations by opting out of the 48 hour week, that must be a separate agreement that cannot be included in the handbook or the contract. It must be a separate standalone agreement that the employee understands they're signing. That was the only other extra point. Thank you, Dean. That's the end of, of that. Well, that's great. And um, thanks, Shona. It's a hugely valuable point that you're mentioning because um, as I think most of the attendees may know we act for employees um, as well, um, as well as companies. And whenever you're acting for um, an employee, in, for example, um, an employment dispute where the employee has contractual policies, um, it's, a, like, it's a little bit of gold as for us as employment lawyers because um, there was one client uh, around about seven years ago um, when we um, started the firm where because the company had contractual redundancy, contractual disciplinary procedures, we which required two or three people to have a committee to meet, and we just tied the company up in absolute knots because everything they did, they wouldn't breach a contract or each um, step of the way we thoroughly investigated. We were saying it's not thoroughly investigated, you wouldn't breach a contract. And in the end, this person had um, a much larger settlement than he should have received. So um, I think absolutely, you know, uh, con what is and is not contractual is absolutely critical. Um, just something quite basic, but something to get just to get right within every single workplace. So um, uh, thanks for covering that, Shona. Your heart sinks when, as acting for an employer, you see a contractual disciplinary policy because actually one of the main threats is an injunction that the mm -hmm. employee can stop you doing what you're doing until you follow that policy that you have made you, the employer, have made contractual. And yes, so you're, you're right, it's the, the swings and roundabouts of each side that we, we, we all act upon. And uh, yeah, good for some, not, not for others. Yeah, fantastic. And we could speak about the cases and, and at this point for hours probably, but we, um, we are going to move on. So thank you, Shana. Uh, the, next, uh, the next of four topics we're going to cover today um, is, I think, a huge topic at the moment as well. And Katie's going to let you all know about her or our, uh, well, actually her, actually, these are all yours, sorry. Um, Katie's, uh, sorry, Catherine's top tips for hybrid working. Thanks, Dean. I, would, I don't think there's anything that I've, I've made up that's, that's new, but, <laughs> but they, are, they are written by me. Um, so I think um, I have uh, 10 top tips and Carl is actually going to cover one of them in his section. Um, so I'll do that one last and I won't cover it. Um, but the first tip that I had was for implementing hybrid working. And for those of you who are implementing hybrid working, this might be something you've already done, but it would be to think carefully about what form of hybrid working you want to implement in the first instance. So hybrid working is an umbrella term which encompasses many different forms of flexible working. So on the stricter end, some employers are introducing set hours and set days working in the office and home, such as nine to five, Monday to Wednesday office based. Thursday and Friday, nine to five, but working from home. Uh, or there's more flexible approaches. So some employers might be allowing employees to work wherever and whenever they like, as long as the work's getting done, or probably somewhere more in the middle of those two. So you need to consider if you're going to implement hybrid working, the needs of the business and taking into account difficulties experienced during the pandemic and what your employees actually want to do. So there may be various, various different hybrid working arrangements across different parts of the business. And then this should be considered and a variety of approaches should be taken. So the employer may want to nominate a particular day of the week in which the whole of the team are physically present together. So this might enhance creativity, a bit of team spirit, brainstorming and all that good stuff. But employers may also want to ask their workforce what their preferences are for hybrid working. So it's important to take a range of views and come to quite an informed decision. Um, that was my first tip. So tip number two is to get your contracts right. This is probably up there with the most fundamental tip of mine and yeah the most important I'd say um, so unless your employees contract already contains a flexibility clause a change to their place of work will need to be with their consent I think that's maybe not going to be a massive issue because it seems that a lot of employees want to do hybrid working and that'll only become a problem 
if you're enforcing hybrid working on the whole of the organization. So I would I should imagine in a lot of cases it might be a bit of choice. So the agree the agreement to change in the first instance is not too much of a worry. Um, but if a hybrid working arrangement is agreed, it, it you need to make sure that parts of the employment contract are updated to reflect the arrangement. So you may want to build in flexibility to such clauses so that the arrangement may be amended in the future in certain circumstances. I know I've spoken to lots of clients who would like the right to bring employees back into the office if there's disciplinary issues, performance concerns. So this needs to be thought about from the get-go. Otherwise, if you're seeking to make this change going forward, it could be a breach of contract. Um, and then potentially it might entitle the employee to resign and claim constructive dismissal. So I think... Probably it might seem tempting to just go with a hybrid working arrangement without putting anything in writing. However, I think we've set out previously our um, guidance on this topic and it's it, each day that goes by under a hybrid working arrangement is an implied acceptance by the employer that home working is fine. And then this, this may become an implied into the contract of employment. It erodes that, that, that clause that's already there that says office based. Um, and it can be a customer practice also. So this means that staff may have a contractual right to work from home and you've got no express clause in place giving you any right to vary that, like I said, for performance concerns, etc. So another thing that I would suggest is to adopt a child periods. So once the working arrangement is agreed, this will be a permanent change to the employment contract, as I've just said. So we'd suggest that employers offer hybrid working arrangements on a trial basis to ensure that managers are actually checking the suitability of a hybrid working arrangement. Again, I think having just had probably a lot of home working for an extended period, it might seem tempting to just say it worked fine, it was great, but this is going to be new, new circumstances. You're going it, with a hybrid arrangement with people coming in, people not coming. You need to assess teams on their ability to work hybridly, not just their ability to work from home in when it's forced upon them. Um, so tip number four is to have a health and safety representative. So all organisations of a certain size are required to employ an individual to act as a health and safety officer. Uh, their role is to prevent work-related illness, accidents and injury in the workplace, which extends to people's homes and when they're working from home. So th this individual can be responsible for ensuring regular risk assessments, equipment checks, and can be the designated individual for staff to go with for a health and safety concern. Depending on the size of your organisation, this may be too much for your current health and safety reps. So you might want to appoint a hybrid working rep or someone else to, to look at these sort of concerns in health, health and safety perspective. Um, tip number five is to do your health and safety risk assessments. So um, you have the same responsibilities in terms of health and safety for staff working from home as for staff working on site. So this includes a duty to safeguard health and safety and undertake appropriate risk assessments. Um, so you will therefore need to undertake a risk assessment for any member of staff working from home, including those working under a hybrid working arrangement. If these were carried out in relation to any temporary arrangements during the pandemic, they need to be done again in relation to a permanent hybrid working model. And then tip number six is consider what equipment is needed and who is going to ensure this equipment. So it's an, it is your responsibility to provide the right equipment to employees working from home, whether at all in the office, and this equipment needs to fulfill health and safety obligations. So conducting a risk assessment is, is referred to above, referred to before, should be enable an employer to know what equipment in particular the employee may need. So an employer is responsible for buying this equipment and for ensuring that it's safe. So if this was not done during an enforced home working during the pandemic, this must be addressed now and risk assessments need to be repeated for employees circumstances changed. So you should also consider who's responsible for insuring company property at the employee's home. And if this is the employee's responsibility, you need to make this really clear. Um, tip number seven is don't forget about mental health for those working from home. So you need to have procedures in place to spot mental health and safety issues, such as stress at work, potential problems arising because of it people might be lone working from home. So your health and safety duty extends to mental health. So as part of this, you may want to consider a lone working policy, a mental health policy, um, establishing appropriate boundaries around working time, um, having an anonymous employee assistance hotline and electing mental health champions. You may already have a lot of these in place. <clears throat> And then tip number eight is to be aware of your data security obligations. So you need to consider data protection legislation and ensure that all staff working from home are adhering to the relevant principles. So you need to educate, train, 
employees need to know their obligations in this regard. This could be how to print, how to store, how to dispose of confidential information. And hybrid work, this must be covered in your data protection policy as well, the hybrid working element. So you should carry out data privacy impact assessments of the data protection implications of any hybrid working arrangement. So this is a separate assessment to your health and safety risk assessments. And then finally, number nine, before I go on to Carl's tip, is if employers are going to allow staff to work from home, you should be putting in place a very detailed policy. This is covering health and safety, data security, and all the other good stuff that I've mentioned. So you want to have a home working policy in place which covers all necessary considerations for a home worker and also implying to a hybrid working arrangement. So therefore, this needs to ensure hybrid workers are covered. Any home working policy you've already got needs to ensure that hybrid workers are covered. And it needs to be clear to hybrid workers that your home working policy applies to them. So that's in the circumstance where you don't think it's necessary to have a separate hybrid working policy above and beyond any home working policy already in place. Um, and then, yeah, finally, my last uh, tip number 10, although it wasn't actually number 10 on my original list, but I have moved it there um, so as not to encroach onto Carl's topic, was to watch out for any potential discrimination. But I believe Carl will be covering this, so I won't cover that myself. And yeah, so everything I've covered today um, will be coming out in an upcoming bulletin. So if you're reading this outcome goes in you might recognize some of the tips or all of the tips there um, and we'd be happy to assist with any um, relevant policies contractual changes advising on strategic issues and we will actually I mean, you may have seen it on linkedin already a um, bit of marketing that we are offering to clients a hybrid working toolkit to include policies contractual updates and addendums and advice so if you want to get in touch about this then please do so that's everything from me. That's, that's great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, Katie. And um, not to repeat everything you've just mentioned, but yeah, this is something that we all think is, is a, a huge issue right now with thousands of people working on contracts that are, have not been properly updated and the right policies aren't in place. So we always want to help our clients, um, help, we want to help their businesses flourish and grow safely and successfully. So we've put together over the last couple of weeks a hybrid working toolkit, as Katie's mentioned. Um, there's loads of documents and it's an advisory service as well. So if anyone's interested in safely implementing hybrid working, definitely drop us a line, um, uh, info at joneschase.com, or you can drop me a line personally, dean.jones at joneschase.com. And we can have a chat with you about the toolkit and everything that that involves. And also, um, K uh, Catherine and Harry have put a bulletin together as well about hybrid working. So that will be being released, I believe, next week. Okay, fantastic. And uh, moving quickly on to um, Carl's section which is all to do with the interplay between indirect sex discrimination and flexible working. So over to you, Carl. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. If I'm cast into darkness, it's because I haven't moved for a few minutes. I'm in a, a, a light motion censored room in the office um, where I've come for free biscuits. But thank you for joining us. So I wanted to comment on this because I recently saw um, the tribunal. So it's only an employment tribunal first instance, but I wanted to see, I recently read it um, in relation, um, uh, it was a case that went to tribunal in April of this year, where a highly paid sales manager for a small private estate agency in central London was awarded headline figure of £180,000 in compensation for indirect sex discrimination. And the case is called Thompson versus Scran Crown Limited trading as man as estate agents. Um, and uh, it was, as it was a discrimination claim, it was in, in front of a full employment tribunal panel. And in it, the claimant raised numerous complaints, including pregnancy mater or maternity leave discrimination, harassment related to sex, constructive unfair dismissal, unauthorised deductions from her wages, and indirect sex discrimination. I mean, why, why claim one when you can claim many other things? This is what I see quite a lot, actually, where relationships deteriorate to such an extent that litigation in follows uh, and the and the claimant sort of throws a kitchen sink at the at the claim at the respondent hoping at least one of the claims will stick now um the her claims were in, in made in the context of her wanting to reduce her weekly hours from 9 to 6 p.m monday to friday to 9 to 5 p.m monday to thursday and to be uh, not at work at all on uh, each friday um, and um, before I look at um, some of the facts of the case, I want to just remind um, those who perhaps haven't revisited this more recently about the current statutory framework for flexible working and also in indirect sex discrimination. So the most recent set of statutory rules on flexible working is, were brought in in June 2014 and are set out in sections 80F to 80I of the Employment Rights Act 1996, supplemented by an ACAS guidance document on handling flexible working requests. 
Um, now, um, in essence, in order for an employee to be entitled to trigger their statutory right to request flexible working, so they only have a right to request it, they don't have a right to receive it, um, is to, um, is first that they have to be continuously employed for at least 26 weeks by the, by the employer. Um, and in their request, it needs to be in writing and they need to date it and they need to set out the change to the working conditions that they are seeking when they would like those changes to take effect. What effect, if any, they think the requested changes would have on the employer and how, in their opinion, any such effect might be dealt with. Uh, and a statement that the re request is a statute request um, uh, and if, if they've made a previous application for flexible working, they need to set that out and the date in which that was submitted. Now, if the employee satisfies each of those uh, elements, then it's, it triggers the statutory rules. If an employee doesn't satisfy one or more of those requirements, in my view, it's sensible to prompt them to do so, to lead them in that direction, because otherwise you, they're just going to repeat the request in, a, in the same way, but in a compliant way later on down the road. And so I think it's more constructive to sort of head them off the pass really and find out what's going on sooner rather than later um, and not to antagonize them necessarily. So, um, uh, if if the employee has previously satisfied each of those elements in, a, in an earlier request, then they aren't entitled to invoke the statutory um, procedure for, for 12 months after the end of the earlier request. So they get sort of one bite of the statutory cherry, so to speak, each 12 months. Uh, however, an employee can raise as many informal, so non-compliant requests for flex working as they wish, but I imagine the more frequently they do it, you're just going to say no, please see our previous response. Now, um, ACAS recommends that you allow the employee to be accompanied at a meeting at which their flexible working request will be considered. If you, if it's a well-drafted flexible working request and you, and you don't, and you're going to accept it, you're happy to accept it, and there is no need for a meeting, you can merely inform the employee that, that you've accepted it. If you don't accept it in full, then you have to arrange a meeting, and if you reject any part of it, um, and there's no subsequent resolution or agreement reached with the employee, then you have to give them the right to appeal, at, at which ACAS uh, recommend that you also allow them to be accompanied at that appeal. Um, and you must um, then provide an outcome in writing unless on appeal you accept the request. Now, um, all, of, all of those steps need to take place within a three calendar month period of time from the date in which you receive a valid statute request to work flexibly and uh, but it can be extended beyond three months if you agree with the employee. Um, now in my experience when um, any of my employer clients have received flexible working request um, the, the main issue or, or sort of risk area is indirect sex discrimination where the reason for the request is to look after a, a child um, and that is because um, and this is a long-standing criticism of the flexible working request regime that the maximum compensatory award for a breach of the, of the statutory rules on, on requesting flexible working is capped at up to eight weeks pay and, and the money for that is also subject to the current um, cap on a week's pay as set out in legislation. So often for most employees it's just not economic to bring that claim alone because of legal fees and the delay in getting in front of a tribunal. The, the juice isn't worth the squeeze so to speak. So it often goes hand in hand with a much what's seen as much more lucrative claim which is indirect sex discrimination which is what occurred here. And in essence in order to bring an indirect sex discrimination claim the claimant needs to show that um, that the, the respondent, i.e. the employer, discriminated against the claimant um, where the respondent applied a provision or a criterion or practice known as a PCP for short, which is um, uh, which, which um, was uh, 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 discriminatory in relation to a relevant protected characteristic, i.e. that the PCP was applied or would be applied to persons with whom the claimant does not share the protected characteristic it put or would put persons with whom the claimant shares the characteristic at a particular disadvantage when compared with persons with whom the claimant does not share the protected characteristic. It put or would put um, the claimant to that disadvantage and the employer cannot show it to be a proportionate means of achieving legitimate aim. So in essence, the claimant needs to satisfy each of those elements in that they need, they need to show a group disadvantage um, so others who share the, the same sex as the claimant in this case, other females will be put 
to a particularly disadvantage as a result of the um, uh, refusal for her to be able to work flexibly, i.e. as a result of the requirement that she works nine till six, Monday to Friday, full time working. Um, um, and that um, she herself was subject to a disadvantage as a result of the continuation of her normal contractual hours of work. Um, and that um, the employer cannot justify um, um, uh, the um, requirement, ongoing requirement for her to work her, her full contracted hours of work. And I think in, the, in an office based role, which is what a role of our employees uh, where they work it's, uh, and employers, it's quite difficult to be able to objectively justify why there can't be some relaxation or reduction in the number of hours of work, especially as we all have technology and, and can take cool calls at, at different times of the day. So it, 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 what, what the claimant did here, Ms Thompson, she went on maternity leave in October 2018, returned in October 2019, and on her return, she submitted a flexible working request setting out that she wanted to work four days a week instead of five and finish at 5 p.m. and not 6 p.m. in each of those days and have Friday off. Now that was um, looked at by some external consultant because her, by that point, the relationship she had with her boss had deteriorated, it was a very small office. Um, and they turned it down, her flexible working request, on the basis of um, um, five of the prescribed eight reasons for rejecting request. And those eight, the, the eight reasons are the burden of additional costs, detrimental effect on ability to meet customer demand, inability to reorganize work among existing staff, inability to recruit additional staff, detrimental impact on quality, detrimental impact on performance, insufficiency of work during the periods the employee proposes to work, plan structural changes. Now there is a te technically a ninth, which is such other grounds as the Secretary of State may specify by regulations, but I don't know about you, I can't think of any other conceivable ground on which the flexible working request could be turned down. Now you only need to show one of those, one of those eight, in order to be able to sort of uh, defend any claim, provided that you took into account facts and you applied a sort of rational outcome to those facts. Um, so if you, if you just, had a prejudice or just had turned your your your, your mind's eye or your, or your ears to what the claimant was saying simply saying no 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 this is the reason the tribunal can stress test and probe that to decide whether you've reached essentially an irrational outcome because you haven't taken into account all the facts so you do need to hear what what the claimant has to what, what the um, applicant has to say so her flexible working request was turned down the basis of burden of additional costs detrimental effect on ability to meet customer demand during the period of five to six um, each each working day, inability to reorganise work among among existing staff. They said that they were just um, everyone else was too busy; they couldn't take on her workload for those hours when she wasn't going to be working. And inability to recruit additional staff. It, they they said that it would be impossible to get someone to come in for one hour because the time that they would commute to come in would exceed the, the amount of work they had each day just for one hour. Um, and and plan structural change, although they gave no evidence as to what that would be. They just quoted the uncertainties arising from Brexit, and so the tribunal rejected plan structural change as a, as a grounds for refusing the request. Um, she appealed against the refusal on the 28th of November 2019. She was on annual leave and then went off sick with a doctor's sick note. And again, this is something we come across quite regularly when the relations are deteriorating to such an extent um, that, that, that that often follows. Um, and the she lodged a claim on the 4th of December 2019. Um, and early than, early than that, she had raised a written grievance and that was rejected. Um, um, as in not upheld, and she resigned on the 12th of December 2019, and she later claimed that was a constructive dismissal. Now, it's interesting reading the judgment that all of the claims she submitted failed, except the indirect sex discrimination claim, and, and the, in essence, the reason for it was that the employer couldn't show that, um, um, that, 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 that the uh, requirement for her to continue working from five to six Monday to Thursday and also be there all day on Friday was a proportionate means of achieving a legitimate aim. They recognised that there was a real business need in satisfying domestic and foreign clients um, who, who, who will be working at different time zones to those in the UK. So they, they were able to satisfy them that the tribunal that they had clients from abroad who were at different time zones. But um, not that not that it would be disastrous for those client relationships for um, her not to be there between the hours of five and six. Um, and they also um, found as a fact that there was another lady in the office who had been recruited to cover for, them, for the claimant's maternity leave period doing the same job as the claimant. 
and who expressed a wish to continue at work in some form or, or other. And so the tribunal held that that lady called Miss Purchase could have covered for the Friday slot because she'd been do doing the job for a year already. So you went, when one looks at objective justification, you, the employer has to be very careful because it's not a case that you have an uh, element of discretion. It's not the case in law that you can turn around and say, well, it's within a band of reasonable responses. Please cut us some slack. It's up to us. It's our business, isn't it? The tribunal will look um, and scrutinise what the legitimate aim is, what, what is the real business need applicable to your business, not just some sort of wider social policy aim, but what is applicable to your business and whether the means you've adopted in order to try to implement or achieve that legitimate aim are, are, are appropriate and necessary to, um, uh, uh, or whether you're actually sort of using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. Is there any less discriminatory means by which you could achieve the same aim? And and I think actually reading this, I do feel a bit sorry for the employer because there was a reference to them using um, peninsula advisors and that, that's obviously a question of cost and choice for them. But the tribunal criticised a letter that was sent. They don't know who it was from, but they believe it was Peninsula, um, where they just got the law wrong on maternity leave and holiday, and where, uh, in what circumstances can an employee be entitled to take um, holiday during maternity leave or at the end of maternity leave, and also during sickness. And and then what seemed to happen was that the, claim, the claimant pushed back and said, you've got the law wrong, I think this is wrong. And then there was another letter that followed saying, no, no, this is what we're going to do. So it was held to be an antagonistic position that they'd taken the claim in relation to her holiday entitlement. And I think the risk is that if you actually don't get sort of quality legal advice early on in the process, then these things can mushroom and um, into expensive litigation. And it might be OK for the employer in the sense that if they had insurance or some sort of product with Peninsula and they got free representation, then so be it. But, you know, they have to now pay £180,000 as a tribunal award. And one wonders why all this ended up in a tribunal could this not have been could there not have been an earlier more positive intervention i suppose one way is um the employer could have suggested we'll give it a go we'll give it a go for three months to see if this one hour each day and this one day each week has such a major impact that they thought it would have on their business but that's quite a difficult um position because if the employee is returning from maternity leave you have to then set up all your arrangements on returning from maternity leave based upon something that may only be temporary as a, on a suck it and see basis so mm -hmm. it, it, it is difficult for both the employee and the employer in those circumstances to, to be suggesting a, let's give it a go but yeah. for their practical circumstances yeah. I'm suggesting. But I think I think the benefit, though, of, of, of having some sort of period during which you make it quite clear as the employer that this is provisional, it's it's only for a period of time, it's not a contractual variation that's secured by you, it's it's a let's look and see if we can um, agree this going forward, it's time limited, is that if there's evidence to show a dissatisfaction by clients or a, or a reduction in business or detrimental impact on the business, they're much stronger grounds for them to defend an objective just to, 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 to show objective justification of the requirement for her to work Fridays and the other hours during the week. Because it is normally my experience with sex discrimination that the objective justification becomes the kind of the difficult hurdle to overcome for desk based, office based, technology based companies. I, I completely agree. I'm just trying to think of the practical implications on the individual as well, but I, mm. I, I completely mm. agree. Um, just checking, Carl, any, anything to add to your section or um, do we move, now move on to Harriet's final section of the day? Um, I think the only, the only takeaway point really is um, whenever uh, is, is to have an open mind about what the wh why the claimant's asking, why the applicant for flex working is asking for what they're asking for. And it's absolutely fine legitimate to say if they're doing it in an informal way, we want you to, to invoke the statutory procedure if if you would prefer that as an employer because you don't want to deal with it informally, you'd rather deal with it within the, the framework of something that, that's more formal. You're absolutely entitled to do that. Um, um, I think just here in Breathe Dragons, where you have someone who is a high performer, has funds and can go and get legal advice and fund legal advice, and is very career driven, but wants some flexibility in the hours in which they work, because they're the ones who sue, um, really, um, in, in my experience. And as I said, the, um, the where it's desk based, office based, I think, um, give a trial period to see how it goes. And you'll then give yourself some breathing space and opportunity to marshal evidence and get, get legal advice if you do decide actually 
beyond that period of time, you are going to reject an ongoing flexible working. Okay, fantastic. And I think um, maybe one thing for employers to consider as well is rather than dealing with things informally, as you said, you like, you can have multiple requests sort of hitting you. If you deal with it formally, then you've got that 12 month period where you know, um, one request can be raised and um, that's frozen and gives the employees sometimes, well, we've already dealt with this. So it's, it's a no or yes or whatever it is. Um, but that can actually help to make things easier to apply some formality to it because I think people can keep asking and changing things and it becomes very complicated when you've got hundreds of employees, isn't it? So, okay, um, right, well, fantastic. So just um, just moving on uh, to um, Harry's fan section with the case update and amongst other things, an important point about appeals and the redundancy process. So over to you, Harry. Thanks, Dean. Um, yes, I just wanted to look at a couple of recent cases concerning the impact on unfair dismissal claims of not holding an appeal, because there's been a couple recently. Um, so the first case is Gwyneth Council and Barrett. Um, this is a court of appeal case, um, and they held that the lack of any appeal or review procedure does not of itself render redundancy dismissal unfair. But it's really one of the factors to be considered when they're looking at the overall fairness of the dismissal, and it may affect the fairness depending on the facts. So just to look in a little bit more detail, firstly, just looking at the, the law um, around this. So Section 98.4, um, of the Employment Rights Act 1996 deals with the fairness of dismissals and it provides that where an employer has shown a potentially fair reason for dismissal and in this case it's redundancy um, when looking at whether the, the question whether the dismissal is fair or unfair first it depends on whether the employer acted reasonably or unreasonably in treating that reason as a sufficient reason for dismissing the employee and it will also be determined in accordance with the equity and the substantial merits of the case. So this test um, as to whether the employer acted reasonably is an objective one and the tribunal has to decide whether the employee's decision to dismiss the employee fell within the range of reasonable responses that a reasonable employer in those circumstances and in that business might have adopted. That's probably a sort of quite a familiar uh, test to you. So therefore in a redundancy case the tribunal is going to look at all of the relevant factors to decide whether the employee's behaviour fell within the band of reasonable responses rather than focusing on one aspect which is fatal to a fair dismissal um, and in this case such as the lack of an appeal. So just in relation to, to this case just looking at the facts, so the claimants were teachers and they were dismissed by reason of redundancy and the school they worked at was going to close and a new school open with new positions available. They were told that their contract would be terminated on a certain date and that a new staffing structure would be determined by application and interview. Both claimants were unsuccessful in obtaining a new post and they received a letter giving them notice of termination with no right of appeal or opportunity to make any representations. And the tribunal found that the employer failed to consult, they didn't decide any pools for selection of affected staff, didn't apply any selection criteria as is normally required and essentially circumvented the whole process. In this case, the claimants had a statutory right to appeal or to make representations set out in staffing regulations because they worked for a school. So uh, quite unusually, in this case, they were being denied their statutory and contractual right of appeal. And the governing body did acknowledge that they should have been given the chance to appeal under the regulations, but they said that this wouldn't have made any difference to the outcome, i.e. they would have still been dismissed on the grounds of redundancy uh, because of the school closure and no appeal panel would have reversed or could have reversed that decision. But what the claimants were saying was, well, we would have appealed against the decision not to appoint us to the staff of the new school. And actually, by not carrying out any consultation, the respondent had just closed its mind to any alternative solution. So they brought claims of unfair dismissal on both procedural and substantive grounds, which were upheld by an employment tribunal. So they found that the dismissals were unfair. And the employer appealed against that on various grounds, um, but including that the tribunal had got it wrong because they essentially held that there was a general rule that absent an appeal, a dismissal would be unfair. And the Court of Appeal dismissed this, uh, as did the EAT, and said so the tribunal hadn't applied that test. But what the tribunal had done is said that the lack of any appeal or review process was substantively and procedurally unfair in this case, because no reasonable employer would have refused to consider an appeal in circumstances where the employee had a clear right of appeal. In this case, it was both statutory and contractual. So the, the tribunal weren't concerned only with the lack of appeal, 
but also any opportunity for the employees to raise a grievance against the procedures uh, adopted or be consulted. So the tribunal did apply a test of overall fairness and they did consider whether the employee's approach fell within the band of reasonable responses. So this decision confirms that where the original selection for redundancy is in accordance with a fair procedure, the absence of an appeal is in itself not fatal to the employer's defence. In this case, obviously, they didn't carry out a fair procedure, so in, in the end it was fatal. Um, but we would advise an employer should consider whether to offer a right of appeal, especially where there's a possibility that there may be a defect in the earlier consultation. And obviously, if you have a redundancy policy or process which says that employees will be given a right of appeal, um, then it's obviously a good idea to do so. Um, the ACAS guide managing staff redundancies step by step also suggests it would be good practice to offer the employee a right of appeal, since this can enable disputes to be resolved internally without recourse to employment tribunals. To go back to Carl's point of you know, can things be resolved um, earlier in, 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 the, in the course of the case rather than things escalating to employment tribunals. Um, and obviously one aspect of consultation is giving the employer the opportunity to contest selection. So if they haven't been given sufficient information at the consultation stage about the selection criteria, you may be able to remedy this defect at appeal. So it might often be to the employer's advantage to offer the right of appeal, um, if, if not only to prevent its absence later being raised as an issue, which goes to fairness. But the second case um, I wanted to look at is an EAT decision, Moore and Phoenix Product Development. Um, so this isn't a redundancy case, it concerned a dismissal for loss of trust and confidence, and the employer relied on the potentially fair reason for dismissal of some other substantial reason of a kind such as to justify the dismissal of an employee holding the position which the employee held, or the normal shorthand SOSR. Um, in this case, the employer didn't offer an appeal, but the dismissal was held to be fair. And it, it confirms that the point that we've just looked at really that, that in an unfair dismissal claim, um, procedural fairness doesn't always require the employer to offer an internal appeal. Um, in this case, uh, where the employer is dismissed because it's irretrievably lost trust and confidence in the employee, circumstances may, in rare cases, the tribunal said, arise when internal appeal would be futile and serve no purpose, with the result the respondent will be acting reasonably and not providing one. So again, just looking at the, the, the law, I mean, as, as we've already looked at, you know, an employee needs to follow normally some sort of procedure before the employee is dismissed and if nothing else, to allow the employee to state their case in defence of themselves before the employer finalises its decision. In SOSR cases, the nature of that procedure is, is going to be, um, is going to vary quite a lot depending on the exact nature of the reason for dismissing. And these kind of cases are incredibly fact specific. Um, and it's going to be a rare case in which the respondent will have found to be acting procedurally fairly where it doesn't allow the possibility of an internal appeal. But this is one of those rare cases and it's useful to, to look at the facts to see um, why the dismissal was fair in this case. So just briefly looking at the facts, um, so the claim that the individual is the inventor of the Propolair toilet, uh, which is manufactured and marketed by the respondent of which he was a founder. And in case you're wondering what is the Propolair toilet, I looked it up and it's the world's lowest flush toilet. So a good product. Um, so he was the chief executive officer of the respondent for 16 years until he was replaced in 2017. He stayed on as an employee and a director, but he had difficulty in accepting that it was no longer his company and he wasn't in charge of it. And following a series of incidents, the remaining members of the, the respondent's board lost confidence in the claimant's ability to change his ways and he was dismissed without being offered a right of appeal. And he brought a claim of unfair dismissal, um, alleging both procedural and substantive unfairness. So as regards the fact that no internal appeal had been offered, the tribunal found that a further meeting would have been futile and of no purpose given there'd been a total breakdown in trust and confidence. And it followed that in those exceptional circumstances, the lack of an appeal process did not make the dismissal procedurally unfair. And what's useful is to look at the, uh, the, the facts in this case, um, which the tribunal considered um, meant that, that not allowing an appeal um, didn't make it unfair. And the, the facts were that the claimant was a board level director and an employee. The respondent was a relatively small organisation with no high level of management. The tribunal found that the claimant had himself brought about an irreparable breakdown in trust and confidence, which was uh, destructive, destabilising and a drag factor to the company. So this breakdown had a big impact on the company. 
and the claimant was unrepentant about his conduct and attitude and hadn't shown any sign that he was likely to change. So I think as with the first case I looked at, you know, we'd usually advise to offer an internal right of appeal following a decision to dismiss. But if you did have a situation such as this with a particularly disruptive senior employee, if you didn't offer a right of appeal, then this will not necessarily make the dismissal unfair. It's, it's going to depend um, on all of the facts. And uh, yeah, that's the end of what I wanted to, to cover. Okay, um, oh, sorry, I think Sharon's got something. Oh, I just, I just wondered about an SOSR policy because or, or employers have capability policies, they have uh, conduct policies. And um, if you had an SOSR policy that you set out within this organization, the type of thing that we thought would fall within that some other substantial reason. And here's what we would, uh, the process we would follow in such set of circumstances. Um, and that doesn't include an appeal. Um, and I think, and, and in that, describing why it doesn't uh, include an appeal because we will have the SOSR meeting. I, I do think that's quite persuasive um, in a tribunal. And also in the, if you don't have such a policy and in the outcome letter for SOSR, you clearly set out why you believe any other examination of this would be futile in any other format. Uh, and I feel quite strongly about that, purely because SOSR is different to capability and conduct, and appeal there is, is uh, right and proper within that band of reasonable responses, whereas I feel very differently with the SOSR and, you know, the redundancy, uh, then it's fact-based, as you say. I don't know what anybody else thinks about that. I think my only thought about that would be... Um drafting a, I feel sorry for the HR pers persons who, who will be asked to the f at first hand perhaps to um, draft an SOSR policy because it is a bit of a mop-up isn't it it's a sort of mop-up of all sorts of a myriad, myriad of situations where um, the cause the reason for the for the wish to dismiss isn't doesn't fall more squarely within the, the other four reasons um, prescribed under uh, the Employment Rights Act. Um, I, I'm not I think I probably would um, buying drafting that policy uh, quite tricky. I think there'd be lots of different. Uh, one would look at the SOSR case law and tease out the, the reasons why there are dismissals there, and sort of so it can be quite a long policy. But uh, I, I mean, you know, tri we know tribunals like policies. Um, it would obviously make it clear it wouldn't be contractual, um, and um, it, 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 if anything, it just manages the expectation of the employee that if they were, if their facts of their case were to fall within the description of what's in the policy, that that's a policy that would apply. But um, it's, it'd be right for some, not for others, I think. But I, I just wanted to add about the right of appeal. I would offer a right of appeal also to to employees who have accepted or who have applied successfully for voluntary redundancy. Um, and the reason for that is that um, voluntary redundancy is a dismissal in law, um, and therefore um, they can claim unfair dismissal. I've never had a situation where someone who has voluntarily applied to, to take a redundancy payment and leave has sued for unfair dismissal, but I can see a situation arising where they may later allege that they were fed false information, something was misdescribed, the, the, the financial predicament of the company was over-exaggerated, um, and, and, and they then saw their job being advertised again, you know, two or three months later and think, uh oh, wait a minute, I'm not happy about that. I was I was led up a garden path. So I would um offer them the right of appeal. Um that won't necessarily mean that if you conceal facts from them that they won't have some sort of remedy. But um best to do that anyway. Most of the time the employees will say, no thank you, I I'm happy with the money and I'm leaving. Just another point about the ACAS uplift. So ACAS uh, provides um th there's a 25% uplift in compensation if you haven't uh, followed their policies for capability and conduct. And um, uh, we have a case at the moment where it is SOSR and the individual trying to apply that uplift to, to it. And we're saying, no, it's not applicable. And, and, and the appeal point is, is one of the points that's being raised. So I think that what, what you don't want is a, a dumping ground for an SOSR policy so you can avoid an uplift argument and or a breach of the ACAS uh, policies. But um, I do think that just like gross misconduct, where you have your list and you say it's not exhaustive, you can give examples uh, as to what would be SOSR. But we will tell you the outcome of our 
25% uplift uh, mm. uh, assertion by an individual in an SOSR case, I hope. Yeah, no, I'm, I, I look forward to hearing that. I mean, obviously, I imagine that in my experience, SOSR is often pleaded alongside another of the fair reasons for dismissal, because there's nothing to stop an employer from plucking for more than one reason, provided it has some sort of factual evidence to underpin what it's saying in its ET3 defence um, or response. Um, so SOSR is sometimes, you know, it sits alongside other things, but um, the, um, I imagine, you know, the 25% uplift is only payable if the tribunal finds that the respondent had uh, um, unreasonably failed to follow a requirement in the AACAS statutory code of practice on disciplinary grievances and where it quite, where, where it doesn't state that it applies to SR dismissals, although I think there's some case law that it, it in certain situations it could, I mean, it states expressly it doesn't apply to redundancies and then and the non-renewal of a fixed term contract, and then it's silent as to what uh, and all the other situations of dismissal to which it applies. Um, be interested to see if they win on that, because well, I suppose I, the employer will say well, we just didn't know because the ACAS code doesn't make it clear to us. Well, I, I suppose if we're trying to hide an alternative reason behind the SOSR and it's actually really capability, then. It, in my view, it ought to be applied, uh, but but we're we're not hiding. We're, mm, we we have just got a very okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, just finally well, on this point, because conscious it's it's sort of kind of five o'clock. Um, I think the SMSR policy is a really good idea, Shona. Um, and it allows the employer to get ahead of the curve a little bit because often SOSR or some of the substantial reasons dismissal happen in the vacuum, don't they? And it's only when you're pleading the case that you might you just say, oh, it's it's one of these, you know. But having that policy to the employee again can get ahead of the curve and have some advantages in, in ultimately um, saying, well, in, in these sort of scenarios, it, this policy will apply, and this is exactly what we're going to do. And so you're, you're disapplying. It's not um, it's not misconduct. It's not gross misconduct. It's not capability, and we have a very clear process to follow. So it, I mean, for example, some cases involving relationship breakdowns. Where there's a dismissal because two people cannot work together there's not misconduct it's not performance you know so having a policy to explain how we propose to deal with these scenarios with or without an appeal process i think having appeals if you can do them is, is a good thing um yeah you know i think it's a really good idea um it is five o'clock so much as we could continue with this um does anybody have any final points to say before we close up no we're all good for today um, well, very, 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 well, my only point would be, um, I always think just allow an appeal because you want all the complaints to be ventilated before the claim form's lodged and it lands on your desk. I always, I'm a <laughs> big fan of appeals. Okay, so, but make sure your appeal is fair because your appeal could be a dreadful, uh, shambolic affair and you'll end up being uh, unfair through the appeal process. So be careful what you wish yeah, for. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Properly carried out. Sometimes the facts don't fit an appeal process as well. I, I, I hit saying that but it can be true so, and obviously before we're instructed sometimes the things happen without an appeal process being followed because SOSR dismissals can happen in a variety of ways not down the usual capability or disciplinary route so yeah a flexible approach um yeah would be beneficial I think and um, yeah just because there's just one minute past five so I'm um, just to wrap up for today um Thank you for joining us on the firm's seventh birthday really appreciate you coming back after the month's absence the information we've covered today is accurate as of the 16th of September 2021. Uh, we've got plenty of content coming away. We've got some bulletins. Interesting, we've got a bulletin coming out about hybrid working, which links Catherine's section with Carl's section. So, so that's actually mentioned. We'll be hearing, uh, we are looking, now that people are coming back to the workplace a little bit more, we are looking to get a annual conference um, up and running this year after, again, not being able to do it last year. So you'll be um, hearing from us about that as well. So plenty of bulletins, webinars, and an annual conference um, coming our way. So uh, just finally for today, thanks so much for attending, and we look forward to seeing you on next month's webinar. Okay, take care. Thanks very much, and bye-bye. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.